Behind me stands a quiet woodlot, an unassuming place filled with trees and wildlife. But in May of 1864, this place would become the scene of unimaginable horror, one of the greatest slaughters of men and one of the greatest human tragedies of the Civil War would occur here. This place is known as the Mule Shoe, and I'm at Spotsylvania Courthouse. My name is Aaron Smith for Forward Gettysburg, and we're on the road here to the Mule Shoe. Welcome everybody to the first of the Forward Gettysburg on the Road series. This is a series that I've been thinking about starting to expand the show's horizons, not only to cover the Battle of Gettysburg, but also more battles of the Civil War. So I'm so excited for this very first episode. I am at what is probably my favorite battlefield that I've ever been to. And if you guys know me, you know I love the Civil War. I've been to every single one I could possibly drive to, but I absolutely love Spotsylvania Courthouse, especially this area of the Spotsylvania Courthouse battlefield known as the Mule Shoe. So thank you guys so much for joining me for this very first episode of Forward Gettysburg on the Road. So let's get into it. March of 1864. Ulysses S. Grant is going to be put in charge of all of the armies of the Union. And in United States history, the last man who was in charge of all the armies was George Washington. So this is a huge, huge responsibility resting on Grant's shoulders. With George Gordon Meade still in command of the Army of the Potomac, Grant is going to make his headquarters in the Eastern Theater. There's no question about it. Politically and in the popular mind, the Eastern Theater is the most important theater of the American Civil War. Grant and President Abraham Lincoln, they're going to devise an all-out strategy, an all-out offensive strategy on the South. And they're going to attack the South on several fronts, on a 1,600-mile front, ranging all the way from the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia to Atlanta to here around Richmond. On May 5th, 1864, Ulysses S. Grant and the 100,000-man Army of the Potomac is going to cross the Rappahannock River into the wilderness of Spotsylvania. And there to greet him will be 60,000 rebels under the command of Robert E. Lee. They will engage in the multi day battle of the wilderness and the wilderness is an area here in orange county and spotsylvania county that is a second growth forest there were a lot of furnaces in this area during the time of the american revolution in the early 1800s and this was nearly cut clear and you have this very very thick growth of trees it was a terrible terrible place to fight in but the rebels are going to use that to their advantage the wilderness, the thick tree cover, is going to essentially negate effective artillery fire for the Union. And this is going to become an absolutely horrific battle, a foreshadowing of what will come here at Spotsylvania Courthouse at the Bloody Angle at the Mule Shoe. The Battle of the Wilderness, it will be very, very close quarters fighting. There will be a lot of night fighting. There are recollections and accounts of the Battle of the Wilderness that talk about the screaming and the shouting of the wounded. And there are sparks that are going to set off forest fires in this very thick wilderness. And the men are going to hear the screaming of the wounded burning to death. Not only that, but in some parts of the wilderness, there are decomposing bodies from the Battle of Chancellorsville nearly a year to the date before. Though Ulysses S. Grant is going to be checked and stopped by Robert E. Lee during the Battle of the Wilderness. Grant is going to be relentless and he is going to continue to push the offensive. Unlike commanders before him of the Army of the Potomac, Ulysses S. Grant and George Gordon Meade are going to continue the offensive against Robert E. Lee. They're not going to retreat back 
beyond the Rappahannock. They're not going to retreat back to the safety of Washington. They are going to continue the offensive against Lee. And this is going to be a huge, huge morale booster for the men of the Army of the Potomac. Grant orders Meade to seize the important crossroads town of Spotsylvania Courthouse. And if you could take Spotsylvania Courthouse, you would have the inside track to Richmond. However, Robert E. Lee is no dummy. He is a tactical genius, and he recognizes the Union's move to seize Spotsylvania Courthouse, and the race is going to be on, and he is going to get here first. There's going to be a series of smaller engagements at places like Laurel Hill. And what Robert E. Lee is going to do is he is going to start entrenching and he is going to make a system of trenches, fortifications, and breastworks that are going to be nearly four miles long all the way to the west at the Po River, over to Laurel Hill, crossing the Brock Road, coming up here, making a horseshoe shape, and then ending just south of Spotsylvania Courthouse to the east. I'm currently inside the rebel lines of that salient, which will become known as the Mule Shoe. Directly behind me, if you can make out, you might be able to see that Napoleon 12 pounder back there. That is going to be the apex of this sailing. And this is a large sailing. The sailing itself is going to be about a half mile wide and it's going to stretch over a mile ahead of the main Confederate line. Now this salient was very concerning to the higher echelon of commanders of the South, especially Robert E. Lee. However, Confederate engineers saw that this was a piece of high ground. This dominated the area around it and they wanted to take advantage of that. They didn't want the Union to be able to place artillery here and fortify this position. So they are going to build this salient into their trenches. They're going to build it into their main line. On May 10th, the Union will devise a plan to attack this salient. Warren's 5th Corps of the Army of the Potomac is going to attack Laurel Hill to the west. Meanwhile, an unusually formed brigade of 12 regiments, masterminded by Colonel Emery Upton, is going to assault the salient and they're going to assault a part of the salient known as Dolza salient where Dolza's Georgians were stationed behind the breastworks and it's going to be a, a brigade of about five thousand Union men. And Colonel Emery Upton's plan is rather unorthodox. Rather than the traditional marching up, firing at the men, then charging forward, he is going to have his brigade hold their fire until they're upon the rebel defenders. Upton's attack will take place here, an area which will later become known as the Bloody Angle. And his attack is going to be initially successful. Those 5,000 men are going to drive through Dole's Georgians and send them retreating. However, as soon as the men break through the line, they lose all sense of unit cohesion. They become less of an organized fighting force and more of a dis organized mob. Though Upton's attack was able to penetrate deeply into the Confederate works and penetrate deeply into the mule shoe, Confederate counterattacks were successful in driving the Union attackers back and the rebels were able to retake the works. Though much of the fighting had been unsuccessful in the days in the areas around Spotsylvania Courthouse on May 11th, Ulysses S. Grant realized that one of the few successes he had was Colonel Upton's attack. And Grant thought to himself and devised a plan. If 5,000 men can break through, and though they were repulsed, successfully carry the works for a brief amount of time, how much damage could an entire corps do to the rebel works? Could an entire corps hold the rebel works? here at the Mule Shoe at Spotsylvania Courthouse. So Ulysses S. Grant devises a plan to take the rebel works and he is going to send the entirety of the second corps, no doubt the premier top of the line fighting force of the Army of the Potomac at that time, led by none other than the hero of Gettysburg himself, Winfield Scott Hancock. And so Grant plans to storm these works 
on May 12th, 1864, early in the morning. Hancock's Second Corps would strike the west end of the salient. Burnside's Ninth Corps would strike the east of the salient, and then elements of the Fifth and the Sixth Corps under Warren and Wright at the time will attack Laurel Hill. Now, Robert E. Lee, in the meantime, is receiving reports that lead him to believe that the Union Army is withdrawing. Perhaps they're trying to steal a march upon his flank. So wanting to get ahead of what he thought was a maneuvering Army of the Potomac, Robert E. Lee will begin to withdraw his artillery from the mule shoe. The morning of May 12th. 1864 was marked by a drenching downpour of rain. Not only that, it was incredibly foggy and a mist covered the battlefield. The 19,000 men of the Second Corps of the Army of the Potomac under Winfield Scott Hancock gathered just over there in those woods beyond me. Along those woods, essentially where that tree line is, is the Landrum Farm Lane. The Landrum House, no longer in existence, is just over there in a clearing over that way. The 19,000 men of the Army of the Potomac's 2nd Corps will march off around 4.30 in the morning. 19,000 men will assault these positions here directly behind the camera and that will begin the longest sustained fighting of the american civil war it will begin one of the bloodiest chapters in american history the men of the second corps will assault the mule shoe and just as they had success on may 10th they again will find overwhelming success initially. They will overrun Jones's brigade, completely, nearly obliterating Jones' brigade. Barlow's division of the Second Corps will swing slightly to the east here at the Mule Shoe, and they will overrun Maryland Stewart's brigade, capturing Stewart, also capturing divisional commander Allegheny Johnson. Bernie's division on the right of Barlow, they will meet much stiffer resistance. They will meet resistance from Walker's Stonewall Brigade, Stonewall Jackson's former commands. Stonewall Jackson, who died nearly a year ago, just a few miles away from here. Now, as I said before, the heavy rain is going to play effect here. And it's going to play effect on the powder of both sides. The muskets, the rifles, they won't fire. So this attack quickly becomes vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting. In the trenches, in the breastworks, there are going to be puddles of mud and blood and bowels all over the place. But nonetheless, despite... The increasing horror, both sides will continue to fight, locked in a struggle to the death. However, just like May 10th, the initial success of the Union Army is quickly, quickly met with increasing confusion and disorganization. And soon, those 19,000 men of the Army's second core being funneled into this whirlwind of death will become disorganized they will become mob-like and the confederates are going to show that they are the better organized and better disciplined army once again as more of these union soldiers are funneled into this increasing horror this increasing pandemonium of terror as one soldier put it they will become more and more disorganized and soon they have a mob 40 ranks deep the Confederates, seeing that their lines have been breached, will send reinforcements as quickly as possible. John B. Gordon will send several brigades to help repulse these attackers and secure the Confederate lines. Lee himself, seeing the breakthrough and fearing for the worst and knowing how highly his men thought of him, how his men would do anything that he asked of them, went to lead 
the men personally to the front. However, many of the men of Gordon's division saw Robert E. Lee leading them and realizing that Robert E. Lee was truly the Confederacy's only hope of independence will begin to chant and shout, Lee to the rear, Lee to the rear. And Robert E. Lee will relent and head back to the rear of the lines to watch the unfolding mayhem before him. As more of these rebel brigades reinforce the salient, Grant will begin to send in more men from the 6th Corps. And soon this mob, this, this mass of blue, will become even larger and even more disorganized. And now those 40 ranks are 60 ranks deep and the men are going to have to step over the bodies of their fellow countrymen just to reach the front lines here to possibly meet the same fate. Now it is approximately 8.15 in the morning. This hand-to-hand -hand fighting has been going on for four hours. Warren finally launches his attack to the west on Laurel Hill. However, Warren's 5th Corps men, they are exhausted, exhausted of assaulting these Confederate works and making no headway. And though only a single division held the Confederate works at that point of the field, his men were unable to assault and successfully carry Laurel Hill. The men, they were incredibly discouraged. They were less than enthusiastic about running up to these entrenched positions and meeting the fate of so many of their comrades days prior. Meanwhile, on the eastern end of the Confederate mule shoe, of the Confederate salient, Burnside's Corps has reached a stalemate with the Confederate defenders. And Lee and Grant, both nearly simultaneously, devise a plan to break this stalemate. Burnside will attack the Confederate works directly. Meanwhile, Lee wants to get rid of a federal artillery position that has been plaguing this sector of the field all morning. Burnside will attack. Now, an interesting point about Burnside is that Burnside technically outranked George Gordon Meade. So Grant, to appease Ambrose Burnside, gave him an independent command of the Federal Ninth Corps, still under Ulysses S. Grant, but nonetheless, he was not beholden to George Gordon Meade. So Burnside will attack this end of the field. And here comes Lane's North Carolinians greeting them. My ancestor, Wellington Adams, by this point in the war, a sergeant greeting the oncoming Federals. Brigadier General Orlando Wilcox's Ninth Corps Division will attack. And during the course of his attack, his flank will be wide open and Lane's brigade of North Carolinians will gladly take that flank and will fire upon them, unleashing a devastating fire, ending Wilcox's attack. As the fighting in these woods raged on, Confederate engineers will hurry to the rear about 500 yards behind the mule shoe and they will begin to construct a new line. They realize, just as the commanders predicted, that this is not a tenable position. The good intents of the engineers to take advantage of this high ground is now quickly working against them. And the hand-to-hand -hand struggle continues for the mule shoe here at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Hour after hour, wave after wave of federal men would come up and assault this position, taking cover in that small valley, that small little dip there, that small little gully, whatever you want to call it, taking cover, no doubt trying to gain the bravery, no doubt their loved ones running through their mind as they rushed up to the Confederate works, many of them to never be seen by their family or loved ones again.
as the rebel engineers rushed to build a new line of works 500 yards south of the base of the mule shoe their fellow confederates were here fighting this area known as the bloody angle we talk about the bloody angle at gettysburg but in my humble opinion by far the bloody angle at spotsylvania was far far more lethal the fighting at the mule shoe will rage on until the very very wee hours of the morning on may 13th the men they will fight at close quarters they will fight and fire their muskets and their pistols at point blank range it was undoubtedly a whirlpool of hatred and gore and bloodshed and viciousness and nonetheless the men of both sides the men in blue and the men in butternut and gray will fight on as the fighting raged on here at the mule shoe at spotsylvania courthouse those small puddles of mud and blood will become deeper and deeper filled with the brains and bowels and body parts of americans fighting each other one soldier will later state nothing can describe the confusion the savage blood curdling yells the murderous faces the awful curses and the grisly horror of the melee some men will claim to have fired over 400 rounds in the fighting here there is an excellent piece at the smithsonian at the museum of american history a tree from spotsylvania courthouse that was sheared in half the stump of the tree on display sheared in half by the total overwhelming amount of lead flying in the air here at spotsylvania my friends my followers it is nearly impossible to put into words and to describe the horror of the mule shoe it is nearly impossible in the english language to describe the terrible terrible scenes of fighting here that occurred on may 12th into the early hours of may 13th 1864. the fighting was horrific the fighting was confusing the fighting was terrible and as the dead bodies began to pile up the men would have to move the dead bodies out of the way and make way so that they could get through and defend or so that they could get through and attack this position that's not even to mention the wounded, many of whom ended up at the bottom of a pile, their friends laying dead or wounded themselves bleeding out on top of them. I can't imagine a more accurate description of hell on earth than the mule shoe here at Spotsylvania battlefield. Some counts tell that the bodies were piled chest high four and five deep and yet these men continued fighting for nearly 22 continuous hours as i said at the beginning the longest sustained fighting of the american civil war as many of the wounded were slowly being entombed in human flesh and human gore at the bottom of these large piles other wounded and other dead bodies as some accounts tell would be hit by so many lead balls that the flesh would simply fall apart by 4 a.m on may 13th 1864 the new lines that the confederate engineers had been constructing were ready and slowly brigade by brigade the confederate forces began to withdraw to this new line just south of the harrison farm i can't put into words how awful how tragic the loss of life here at the mule shoe was how tragic the loss of life during the entire overland campaign was for both sides by this point the american civil war was at a turning point no longer were the men engaged in these very napoleonic style battles 
you line up, I line up, we fire at each other, and then we charge in the middle of a field. No. The tactics had to change. Robert E. Lee realized that trench warfare was the way forward for the Army of Northern Virginia. And we begin to see the seeds of that trench warfare that will later play major roles at Cold Harbor, the Siege of Petersburg, those battles there around Richmond. We began to see those seeds flourish and grow into full-grown plants here at Spotsylvania. The 22 hours here at the Mule Shoe on May 12th are some of the most vicious, terrible, bloodiest fighting not only of the American Civil War, but in all of American history. Nearly 9,000 men of the Army of the Potomac will be casualties here during the fighting for the Mule Shoe. Nearly 8,000 men of the Confederate Army will be casualties, 3,000 of them captured. And though Grant would go on and continue pressuring Lee, it's hard to imagine many of the men forgot the terrible, vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting here at the Mule Shoe. In fact, I recall one account by a Confederate soldier saying that many of his fellow countrymen died of wounds to the head, and thus is the price to pay for fighting behind breastworks. You can only imagine being in a breastwork feeling that you're somewhat protected deep down in the ground perhaps there's a head log and the man next to you no doubt the man in the same company as you a man you more than likely grew up with a man you might have went to school with a man you might have played around and, and farmed and worked with is shot in the head in a brutal manner or perhaps he takes a bayonet to the neck it's truly horrifying the bloodshed that happened here at Spotsylvania Courthouse. This pandemonium of terror would lead to over 17,000 casualties for both the North and the South. One soldier, very appropriately, will describe this place as a Golgotha, the biblical place of skulls. Well guys, that's what I have for you today. Thank you so, so much for joining me again for the very first episode of Forward Gettysburg on the Road. This is a series that I hope to do throughout the year. I love to visit new battlefields I've never been before. I love to visit battlefields that I've been to dozens of times. So look forward to episodes featuring Antietam, Chancellorsville, The Wilderness, Falls Bluff, um, you know, Cedar Mountain, uh, <laughs> South Mountain, all these great, great battlefields that maybe oftentimes take a back seat to the Battle of Gettysburg. Again, thank you so much for joining me. If you guys like this video, please remember, leave a comment, let me know what you think, and subscribe to the channel. As always, my name is Aaron Smith for Forward Gettysburg, and I will catch you on the next one.